going on, everybody? It's your buddy, it's your pal, Spaz Phoenix, the YWC Reality Check, and this is your AEW Dynamite review for January 19th, 2022. The cards on the table. I almost had company on this review tonight, but it didn't quite work out. But hopefully, cross all your fingers, cross all your toes, cross all of your other appendages as you so fit, see fit. I may have company tomorrow night as I sit down to talk about previewing the Beach Break special that is coming up next week, which looks like a pretty fucking decent show. And you guys know the deal. It was the same thing in NXT. It's the same thing in AEW. When they do what I refer to as an elevated episode of weekly television, I do a preview instead of a review so I can sit down and watch, treat it like a mini pay-per-view, etc. So cross your fingers, cross your toes, cross your nuts that I uh, may have some company with me on that preview and we can just talk about what's going on <clears throat> in AEW in general but let's talk about tonight's show there was a lot of hype going into tonight's show which is good L -l a lot of hype going in before a special kind of like you had battle of the belts and there was more recognized championships fought for on the dynamite before and all that kind of thing i could go down that road i'm really not going to because we started off tonight's episode with the return of john moxley and all i can say all it says on my notes is that fucking reaction welcome back um you know chanting for mox chanting for moxley um all that kind of thing he started to speak, and I there I didn't hear it, but there must have been a heckler in the crowd who said, you can go fuck yourself, get that asshole out of here, and then the crowd started heckling the heckler, which was great. Um, John Moxley pacing around the ring, as erratic as ever in, the right, in, in all the right possible ways, talks about his demons, talks about, um, you know, everybody... Basically, uh, he, he says some things that other people have said before when they've come back from similar situations, but I, I got to put it out there and maybe I'm a bit of a mark, but stuff like this sounds more real when it comes from a guy like Mox. He talks about his demons, talks about how he's got more scars on his body than most human beings typically would, but it's the scars inside that, that count. And if you're dealing with something, stand proud and, and be exactly who you are, scars and all, which is a great message. Uh, a lot of people want to write me off after, after this, after leaving in October, go ahead and write me off if you want to, but I don't run from my demons. I beat the shit out of them and I'm more free than I've ever been and I was really worried going into this show because this is this is real shit like I, I compare a comeback I always compare a comeback with an interruption to um, and I hate to use the WWE reference but I'm gonna um, Undertaker coming back before Wrestlemania and before he can even say a word he gets cut off by Triple H coming back for Wrestlemania and neither one of them has to say a word they just look at the at the logo and basically there's your match now that was really cool because that was two part-time guys saying yeah we're back for Mania this is somebody coming back from shit that's real and I don't mean to denigrate anybody else that has to take time off for anything else but this is fucking real and I was really really scared that they were going to overlap the Moxley return with the Cody return. They didn't. Cody returned later on, and he was just as obnoxious as I expected him to be, but they didn't do it. They didn't infringe it on this Mox shit, which is really, really good. And as I say, as far as the real shit goes, um, you guys will remember when uh, Roman Reigns had to step away because his cancer had come back. Kristen and I did a quick video on there, and it's just like, drop the guard, be a real person for a second, and Moxley managed to drop the guard, be a real person for a second, but yet still be Moxley. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna dwell too much on it, other than what I've just said. If you don't know, go back and watch the promo. It was really good. I'm probably gonna go watch it again, but right now I'm talking to you guys. In the back, MJF talks, sort of talks shit to CM Punk, but as really a way to bury Wardlow, who's sitting right behind him. Uh, he then says, yeah, you put your hands on me last week, I'm gonna have to dock your pay, but hey, if you start getting some wins back and get me a, get me a title that you can then hand me, uh, we'll be back on good terms again. He gives him all this news as a birthday present, apparently. <coughs> now, as far as in-ring action, the match that I was looking most forward to, the match that should have been the main event, in my opinion, was the first match of the night, and that's Cole and Baker versus Orange and Statlander. This was, I mean, I do have notes, I am gonna go through them, I'm gonna... Uh, obviously pull out some highlights of the match, but this match was just fun. Um, I thought about just writing this match is fun and and just going and watching it, but um, Cole and Baker 
and Orange and Statlander. Statlander's got a fun gimmick. Orange Cassidy's got a fun gimmick. The DMD is a fun gimmick for the most part. And Cole can fit right into that and still manage to be a fucking force at the same time, which is really cool. I, I will still say it. Cole has every little, every comparison that people make between Adam Cole and Shawn Michaels is fully valid, right down to the super kick. Um, but he can, he can be in a silly situation. He can be serious within the silly situation. He can elevate that silly situation and everybody wins. I was really hoping by, uh, by some weird stretch of the imagination that Statlander would get a pin on Baker. We would get another women's championship match out of that. That didn't happen, but we started off with a lot of tag baiting. We had, uh, because it's a mixed tag, the women fight the women, the men fight the men, except for when the women fight the men because equality doesn't exist. Um, but, you know, Baker would tag in, so Statlander would tag in, and they would start to square up until she tagged out and Cole came in, so Orange had to come in, and then he'd tag back out again. And it was, it was all sort of that initial get-in-your-head type stuff, but uh, Orange does the lazy kicks to Brit, which starts the breaking of that the men fight the men, the women fight the women thing. Uh, great stalling vertical suplex by Statlander that was assisted by Orange. He basically watched her do the uh, do the stall in the vertical suplex and then eventually said, okay, that's enough, and pushed them both over, which was good. A sideways moonsault by Statlander followed by a fall by Orange Cassidy, both off the ropes. This wicked sideways moonsault that Statlander does, followed by Orange basically falling over on Cole was cool. Super kicks by Cole and Baker in stereo are nice. Uh, Britt Baker curb stomps Orange Cassidy at one point. Um, Statlander goes to go for the Area 451 splash, which I think is a nice... The alien thing, I used to make fun of it. It's growing on me. It's fine. She goes to do the Area 451 splash on Brit. Cole tries to block it, and what happens? They both eat the splash. It's fine. Brit hits the Panama Sunrise on Statlander on the elevated ramp. Now, I do have to say... Feels like they were in a smaller venue tonight. It could be just the way it was filmed. They did have the ramp that levels up with the ring, and as I've said before, I can't stand that. Aesthetically, it bugs me. I can't put my finger on why. Don't ask me why. I don't have reasons for my reasons, but whatever. It is what it is. Britt Baker and Adam Cole bring a, uh, a table to the outside of the ring. Then in the ring, Cole and Orange Cassidy are doing the zigzag back and forth along the ring. Orange bumps Britt through the table off the apron through the table on the outside the look on his face sells it the crowd went from oh this is all fun we like all four of these guys cheering for all four of these guys went from that to you fucked up mode low blow last shot uh a pin on Cassidy that was initially missed by the referee because the referee is obviously tending to Britt Baker but he does get the count eventually and uh the Coles I guess you could say are the winners. Now, this is going to go on later on in the night, or actually in a couple of seconds. What I loved about this, AEW does all the faction shit, right? AEW has, you know, the elite and all the different iterations of the uh, elite, the elite, uh, the elite that was led by uh, Kenny Omega, now the elite that seems to be led by Adam Cole. You've got the best friends, you've got the Matt Hardy and Andrade conglomeration that's happening. What I loved about this is yes, they brought in Statlander, yes, they brought in Britt Baker, but it was Adam Cole and Orange Cassidy. None of their boys with them. None of the best friends were there. None of uh, none of uh, Chaos was there. The Red Dragon wasn't there. The Bucks weren't there. Uh, as much as it was a tag match, there was no accessorial stuff. There was no accessorial leftover people on the outside, and that made this match cool. For, uh, for a company that has so, so many intertwined stories... I'm sorry, somebody coming out representing the Dark Order doesn't need the other ten members of the Dark Order out there all the time. Do they? Do they not? But it made it unique. It was it was a really good match. It was really fun. Um, we cranked the intensity up to 11. At the end, we got a more serious Adam Cole. He snapped to uh, results that we're going to talk about in a moment. But it was good. We went to the back, and there's inner circle drama because Jericho, Jericho, Santana, and Ortiz are facing... 2.0 and Daniel Garcia at Beach Break. One of the one of the cool matches we're going to see at Beach Break. But at the same time, Jericho has to take a minute to shit talk Eddie Kingston, to which Santana and Ortiz are like, "Yo, that's our boy. Uh, maybe don't talk, maybe don't shit talk Eddie Kingston, and maybe we don't need you anymore." So all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they start dredging up all this stuff that they resent about Jericho, and it was a little forced. It was a little artificial. It was a little put on. We're going to get that Jericho. 
we're going to get that Jericho Kingston match, aren't we? And the interesting thing about that is you got to remember Kingston, among a lot of other people, is closely associated to John Moxley. So, is does that eventually bring us back around to Jericho and Moxley again? I don't know. I don't know who's the baby face in the heel because Jericho's always kind of a dick, right? Kingston, people love the guy. But he makes no bones about being a dick. If you throw Moxley in the mix, he's very proud to be a dick. Um, I don't know. I don't think for because um, we had an, we had enough of. Oh my God! Can the can the why can't I think now? Can the inner circle get along when it was infiltrated by MJF and and Wardlow? We don't need to tease that again so soon, in my opinion, unless unless Jericho is fucking off for a long time and you want to play out the story that the inner circle has completely disbanded, then you don't do this. If they're going to go off and do their own thing, Santana and Ortiz are going to go do their own thing, Sammy Guevara is going to do what we're going to talk about in a second, and God knows where Jake Hager is, then fine, cool. But don't do it if you still want the inner circle to be a thing. I hope I've made myself clear, because I think I talked myself in a circle twice there. We got Cole uh, in the back, pissed off, obviously, that his lady's been put through a table, even though people get put through a table nightly. So don't talk about your lady like she's super fucking delicate. We've seen her in Lights Out matches. We've seen her bleed. It's fine. She's fine. But storyline-wise, the guy wants to stick up for his girl. I can respect that. And he challenges Orange Cassidy to a Lights Out match next week at Beach Break, which is going to be fantastic. Can I mention for a second the idea that we're having Beach Break beach break in January when especially in the area of the world that I live in right now on Monday we had the worst snowfall since the 90s is hella funny I'm just putting that one out there we had the long awaited CM Punk versus Sean Spears match and before I talk about the match because there's so much to talk about in the match I looked in the crowd, and I don't know how CM Punk's pants have become a topic of conversation. I've laughed about it. When I've had Guapo on here with me, we've laughed about it. I know they've brought it up more times than they probably should on What Culture, mostly because Michael Sidgwick is weird and looking in that area more than he probably should. But there was a sign in the crowd that said, Long boys are better than CM trunks. And I'm just... like, like the. the the attire is is on the signs now. Uh, I was kidding. There's nothing to talk about in the match. Spears gets in the ring, eats a GTS, eats a pin. Lol. But MJF talks some shit from the ramp. They have a, they have the long distance stare down. Punk sort of shrugs it off like, ah, oh, this guy's a coward. He's not going to come in. Try MJF tries to jump him from behind, and Punk owns him once again. Grabs him by the scarf. MJF scarpers out of the ring, and Punk gets himself a scarf, which is wonderful. Really, really awkward, badly acted, badly played out parking lot scene between Billy Gunn, yes, in 2022, Billy Gunn and Christian Cage. Oh yes, Billy Gunn talking about how his boys are always overlooked and roddy roddy rod, and they should get a title shot, and Christian says, yeah, basically he says, yeah, go and do something, and then maybe you'll get a title shot. So the boys come in, three-on-one beatdown on Christian Cage. They throw him into the bay door. It is what it is, but it was cringy as hell. And I, I don't care about the Gun Club versus Jurassic Express, guys. I'm just putting it out there. I mean, I've said it before. I said it when I was still reviewing NXT, and I'll still say it now. NXT still, for the most part, has pretty great women's wrestling. AEW still has the firm choking grip on the tag team uh, wrestling scene, so there are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of options that uh, are going to come before. I mean, I'd rather see 2.0. I'm not going to lie. That would be entertaining because you'd have Daniel Garcia and Christian Cage fighting on the outside while, uh, while Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy try to get a taste. But uh, it is what it is. Cody Rhodes comes out. Be because of course he does. And during the pitcher in pitcher, he sets up a ladder. He brings out his title, which shouldn't be his because he had to get somebody else to defend it for him at Battle of the Belts, but whatever. He has a nod to CM Punk, who just had a match. He basically bases his whole promo on the pipe bomb promo. So 
I'm Cody Rhodes, and I'm going to make a speech in the middle of my AEW ring, and I'm going to do it based on a speech made by CM Punk in the company that I always try to make fun of, but that's fine. But he goes on, and it's really long-winded, and it's really, ter and I know he thinks he's dramatic, but he just sounded a bit drunk, if I'm honest. I'm not saying that is a bad thing, especially with the return of John Moxley. I'm not making light of that, but he, he, he did. He, he sounded like he was on something. Basically, this guy had the balls on him to to mention CM Punk's pipe bomb, but then say he's the one that lived out what the pipe bomb promised to the world, I guess, I guess you could say. And then he just go and then he just rambles on and on and on, but he just he just picks headlines like Google Wrestling Headlines 2022. He mentioned the open door. He said he built the open door. He talked about the Wednesday Night War, even though the Wednesday Night War hasn't been a thing in ages. He has to drop Gunther because, of course, he does. Um, tries to put over... Oh, oh, bless his heart. He tried to put over the TNT Championship as not being a secondary title, which it is. And then he came back around and basically said that it's a secondary title because there's two titles. And what do we do about that? And he says we're going to hang both belts above the ring and we're going to we're going to hang both belts above the ring and we're going to have one undisputed TNT champion so there's a whole lot of problems with this first of all he came out here and said he's the one that upheld the promise that CM Punk made to the WWE fans which is weird and convoluted and egotistical all on its own now he's going to ape the uh, the Shawn Michaels um Oh, who was it? Shawn Michaels' Razor Ramon ladder match for the Undisputed Intercontinental Championship, which, let's be real, is the number two title in the WWE. He's trying to claim that the TNT Championship isn't the number two title in uh, in AEW. Here's the thing. Because they do so much great tag team wrestling, it the TNT Championship is probably the number three title. It, it really is. So there's that. So he thinks he's Razor. He thinks he's Shawn Michaels. He thinks he's CM fucking Punk, which is which is wonderful. And he's put himself back in the ring with one of the most over guys in his company in Sammy Guevara. And once again, we go back to the problem that I had a few weeks ago when I was previewing their match. And it's like, either he's going to squash this kid and take the belt for himself again, or... Sammy Guevara is going to win, and he's going to brag about how he got Sammy Guevara over, and now he's popular because I let him beat me. It's like, no, he's already over, and you need to stop claiming credit for that shit. Now, all that aside, frustratingly enough, this match is going to be fucking awesome, because as much as I can't stand Cody Rhodes and almost everything he does, he has to remind us that his wife is black and his kid is mixed, and he has to remind us that he's the, the, the chairman of the board. He, he, is, he is Vince McMahon if Vince McMahon was still a teenager. That's what Cody Rhodes is right now. And, and, oh my God, it's, 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 you've got this whole separate thing. Oh, I've let my contract expire. I'm not an AEW guy. I'm a free agent. But you're going to solidify this AEW championship that you're trying to get over as being equal with the, with the world championship. And you're one of the bosses of the company and you're trying to get out on social media and treat fans like they're morons and pretend that you're not contracted to the company anymore. Go fuck yourself. All do all do appreciation in advance for the awesome match that they are going to give us next week. But Cody Rhodes, you can still go fuck yourself. And I really do think Sammy Guevara is going to get screwed next week. And that's really, really unfortunate. Speaking of people getting screwed and people carrying titles that they don't deserve, Jade Cargill is going to defend her TBS championship on Rampage against Anna Jay. Yay! House of Black debuted for the first time on AEW, taking on the Varsity Blondes. Now, you have to imagine, or at least I'm imagining, if Ray Phoenix... Uh, hadn't gotten injured, hadn't royally fucked up his arm the way he did in the Tag Team Championship match where they lost to Jurassic Express, I have to believe that this would be House of Black versus the Lucha Brothers, which would be fucking fantastic. I don't know anything about Brody King, right? Oh, yeah, that's right. The other thing, Cody Rhodes, he tried to, in every promo, he tried to get himself over by mentioning Brody Lee again. And he said, oh, this new guy, Brody King, he must have some balls coming into AEW with the name Brody. It's like, go fuck yourself. Um, 
I don't know anything about Brody King. I believe he's from ROH. ROH is on hiatus, which leads to the ROH invasion and impact that I'm really enjoying. I should probably do a separate video on that at some point. But this dude, along with Malachi Black, they are tag team champions somewhere. I don't know where. I didn't check. Sorry. But these guys are a fucking unit. And they're taking on the Varsity Blondes, who are a very nice mid-card team that is very good at getting beaten up. And that's what it is. And here's the thing. I am loath to give any credit to the gigantic bag of salt that is Michael Sidgwick of What Culture. But he did make a pretty good point on the on the uh, Dynamite preview this week when he quoted somebody else. I think it was Terry Funk that said, don't get too good at jobbing or that's what you'll be doing your whole career. And you see that with Ziggler, you see that with Cesaro, you see that recently with Apollo Crews and guys like Finn Balor. Um, Varsity Blondes are very much in that in that park as well. House of Black, it's their debut, so obviously they're going to win. Obviously they want to present these guys. They've presented Aleister Black pretty great, so presenting him in a tag team scenario isn't going to be that hard. So you know he's going to win, but you put him up against the Varsity Blondes and you definitely know they're going to win. I didn't even check. Is Julia Hart still a pirate with the eye patch on the wrong eye? Is that a thing? Whatever. Varsity Blondes died. Uh, they they just died. The end. That's what my notes say. Uh, after the match, you get the another creepy blindfold um, uh, promo, whatever you want to call it, pre-recorded package from Pac. And I don't know if it's all pre-recorded because he's supposed to be at home nursing his eyes or whether he's actually back at home overseas. I don't know. I haven't looked it up. Um, if it's going to be a matter, a matter of substitution where it's going to be Pac and Penta versus the House of Black, that is something you can sign me the fuck up for. And uh, Pac cutting a promo to be about as creepy as the House of Black are he doesn't exactly fail at it. I'm just putting it out there. I know there are certain people out there that don't like the spooky bollocks, but uh, give it all. Tap it into my fucking veins. Eventually, these guys are going to take on Sting and Darby, and holy shit, I need to talk about that too, don't I? Rapungi Vice taking on the Bucks on Friday, and they, they touch briefly on their history with the Bucks in New Japan, and... Did they fight in ROH as well? Somebody tell me down in the box below. I really don't know. Rocky Romero and Trent Beretta. I'm getting names mixed up, so sorry about that. Later on in the night, in Hype 4 Friday, they did do a little video package of these guys in the various places and the various titles that they've traded and whatever, and I thought that was really cool. Um, to my knowledge, this Friday's Rampage was not recorded tonight. It's actually... They're actually doing a live rampage on Friday. So I don't know whether that means we can expect more extra because it's not going to be spoiled. They want to give us, you know, they want to give us a reason to watch, obviously. Um, but this is this is this is worth watching. Um, you know, Cargill versus Anna J. Anna J just getting squashed by, you know, female Ryback isn't exactly a, a selling point, but it is what it is. And then we go down the Depression Trail a little bit more, and we see Lance Archer versus Kazarian. Kazarian should be doing so many better things, but Lance Archer's going to win because he's the next one facing Hangman Page. Hangman Page could take on anybody, and I would care more than Lance Archer. Lance Archer's a beast. Don't get me wrong. He's going to come in, and he's going to have a Lance Archer match where he throws people around for a little bit and either wins or loses at the end, depending on who he's facing. But honestly... Putting him in a ring tonight with Kaz just makes me think, okay, regardless, Hangman Page is not going to lose his first title defense. But as far as somebody that could go in there, make him look like a million bucks, and somebody that I'd much rather see, put Kazarian in there. Kazarian versus Hangman Page is a match that I would watch the fuck out of. Because they've dropped him. They've absolutely dropped him. He was doing the elite the Elite Hunter uh, gimmick for a bit that I thought was really cool, that had legs, and he was picking up various other partners in crime along the way to try and take out the Elite. That sort of fell by the wayside. That Elite Hunter gimmick took him back to Impact, and he had a couple matches there. I think he fought... Who did he fight there? I think he fought uh, Chris Sabin in a really, really good match on Impact. I, how do you have somebody like Kaz on your on your radar, on your, on your roster, and not do anything with them? He came in with SCU. Danielson... Christopher, okay, sorry, Christopher Daniels uh, isn't wrestling anymore. Scorpio Sky went the heel route, and now he's in another tag team. Kaz, put him in the TNT picture. Kaz versus Sammy Guevara, 
who deserves to, to wear that belt and probably won't because the world doesn't like me that much. Them fighting for that title is more exciting to me than Mr. I'm the boss, but I'm going to pretend I'm not in the company anymore. <laughs> Shoot me in the face. Layla Hirsch talks some more shit to Chris Statlander after their match on Rampage last week and making fun of her for not winning tonight. She's sitting there nursing her neck, and Vel uh, Red Velvet, who's stuck in the middle, is checking on her after the match from earlier tonight. And and then Layla Hirsch just attacks both of them for reasons. Now, I will say, there's a match that I would really love to see between two relatively small, relatively powerful spark plug wrestlers, and it's not going to happen because they're in two different companies, but I would love to see Layla Hirsch versus Ivy Nile. I think that would be a surprisingly fantastic match. I'm just putting that out there. It is what it is. Speaking of things that I wish I could care more about, which I wasn't, but I'm about to, Serena Deeb versus Sky Blue. Serena Deeb is doing this new evil heel thing. I get it. She destroyed Sky Blue, who I know nothing about, and it's building eventually to another round of her versus Hikaru Shida. Now, I like Serena Deeb. I like Hikaru Shida. I, they have great matches when they're in the ring together, but there's something missing from this that's just... I don't know. I don't know why... Even though I can look at their matches, the matches are great, the matches have accelerated to the point where two people that have had multiple matches should have accelerated too. Somebody suggested that they're going to have a lights out match. I don't think it warrants a lights out match. I'm sorry, I just don't. Um, but Serena Deeb is in a weird spot because she carries so much respect with her from her history on the indies and then you know she did some backstage stuff in WWE and they wanted her to be a coach and oh my god isn't that a terrible thing even though it's actually a really really respectful thing. Um, she carries so much respect f with her when she comes to the ring, and you can even s hear it with the commentators sometimes, because they don't know how to, I don't think they know how to put her over as this heel character that she's trying to put off, but she kind of feels like Natty, in a sense. Now, I don't mean that she's collecting cats and, and, and turning farts into a gimmick. What I mean is incredibly respected, incredibly technically sound, probably a locker room leader, and loved and respected by virtually everybody, and then she walks through the curtain and she has to try and play this heel. Like, Natalia turning heel is just her coming out and cheating a little, or telling a really bad joke at somebody's expense, or just being a bit obnoxious, when you know that she's one of the most respected women in that locker room. And I think Serena Deeb is the same way. I, I believe her as a vicious competitor. I don't believe her as a heel and I don't that's why it doesn't click for me and Hikaru Shida is there and she's gone and she's there and she's gone and right now I know she's selling the fact that uh, Serena Deeb injured her but it's just it's it's a rivalry that's kind of limping along so in the meantime we have to keep Serena Deeb hot as a heel we have her squash sky blue who just comes in all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed you know happy to be here type thing and none of it really carries, even though there's nothing wrong with it. Even though the match was cool, they had a really awkward angle uh, with the overhead camera when she put her in the Serenity Lock, and it was just like, let me point your crotch at the sky, and it was bad. And that was, again, not them. That was uh, very much the cameras were not flattering to either one of them. Ethan Page, in the back with Dan Lambert and Scorpio Sky, Ethan Page wants to die. So, we achieve that by him challenging Moxley on Rampage on Friday. So, he's going to die. And also, we get it slipped in somewhere in the middle that Hook is taking on Serpentico. And I like Hook. And Hook, Hook, Hook is good shit. Now, the main event was... Blah. I'm sorry. They, make, they, they load the first hour heavy on Dynamite. They load the first half hour heavy on Rampage. And I think they, they, even if I think back to the last pay-per-view, I think they did the same thing. But Acclaim versus Sting and Darby is just another Sting and Darby tag team match. You know, X team comes in and kicks the shit out of them for a little bit, and then Sting and Darby get the feel-good victory. Now, I don't mind them getting a feel-good victory. I don't mind Sting being on this, you know, resurgence run that he's on. I don't mind Darby Allen getting wins, obviously, because I'm a huge fan of Darby Allen. But the way they set this up, they brawled before the match started. They did this the steel chair necktie to Darby Allen, and then the ref made Sting start the match anyway as a handicap match. And of course Darby came back. They proceeded on with a regular tag team match and Sting and Darby got the win with the coffin drop and it is what it is. I I wish there was more to it than that. The acclaimed 
should be on their way to tag team championship gold. They should be taking on Jurassic Express and giving us fantastic matches, not facing off with teams that are really just two individuals. And that's what Sting and Darby is. Um, I want Darby to be doing way more. I either want Darby to go do some cool singles shit, or I want goth dad and his son to take on Aleister Black and Brody King. Uh, but that's more for the aesthetic than anything else. I really hate to leave this on a down note, because I like the acclaimed and I like Darby and Sting's doing what Sting does. Uh, but there wasn't much to write home about about it, and if you consider that this is a match that started with a steel chair necktie and ended up with a guy that's retired a couple of times holding his own in a handicap match, uh, you're not delivering. You're not delivering at the finish line, uh, Dynamite, is what I'm saying. I've said it to you guys weeks after weeks after weeks now. Dynamite has the stuff that I'm absolutely stoked for and the stuff that I couldn't give a shit about, and there's very, very little in between. Now, what I am excited about is, let's talk about Friday, we got Rapungi Vice taking on the Bucks. We've got Serpentico versus Hook, which just means Hook's going to come in and do Hook things. We got Jade Cargill burying Anna J. Yay, wonderful. And we've got J uh, John Moxley, who's going to come in and kill Ethan Page, which is nice. Now, Beach Break. Looking forward to Beach Break. I'm not going to say very much right now, because I am going to do a separate preview for it. But it does look pretty good. Jericho, Santana, and Ortiz taking on Garcia and 2.0. Uh, Red Velvet is taking on Layla Hirsch for reasons other than the quick little attack that she had tonight. We've got Cole and Cassidy in the Lights Out match, which is obviously going to be at the end of the night. But the title match that's probably going to come just before that is the unification ladder match for the undisputed TNT Championship between Cody, by God, I sucked my own cock for Christmas Rhodes, and Sammy Guevara. It does sound good. Now, all, all the shitting that I do on Cody that's perfectly legitimate doesn't change the fact that that's going to be a great match. Velvet, or sorry, Red Velvet versus Layla Hirsch could be interesting. Statlander is obviously going to get involved. The trios match is what it is. Cole and Cassidy are going to bring the house down with the lights out match. That's, uh, that's the quick and dirty version of what I think of those matches. I think they're going to add something else on there. I, I don't know when this Lance Archer and Hangman Page thing is happening, but I really hope they're not dragging it out to a pay-per-view. That's just me. Anyways, I'm uh, I'm slowly, slowly, if you guys have been following me the past couple weeks, I've been talking about how my voice is kind of shit and I've been feeling kind of shit. I'm slowly getting better. So I slowly am beginning to believe that I don't sound as much like shit, which is good, which is why you guys are going to get me again tomorrow. Um, put your thoughts down in the box below if there's anything else you want me to touch on in the in the Beach Break preview, anything that's going on in AEW in general that you guys don't think I've talked about in a while, I might slip it in as a, as a little extra to that conversation. But other than that, I've been Spaz, your YWC Reality Check. Subscribe up there, talk down there, start a conversation. Keep all these conversations going. Don't be a stranger. I will talk to each and every last one of you later, but for right now, tagging out. Bye, guys.